this week on the Back Table Podcast. The only way I learned how to do anything that I can do is because I either was forced to take the time when I was in training or I chose to take the time after training to go and learn stuff. And, you know, when I was fortunate enough to go train on the surfacer, it was like one of those things like, yeah, I'm going to do this thing. It looks pretty cool on paper. I don't know. And then you see it done the first time. You're just like, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I want to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Backtable Podcast. If you're a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, which is backtable.com. Very easy to remember. Subscribe to the show, leave us a review, or reach out to us on social media. Now a quick word from our sponsor. There are approximately 700,000 patients in the United States being treated for end-stage renal disease, or ESRD, due to kidney failure. Globally, the incidence of new ESRD cases continues to grow at an aggressive annual rate. To stay alive, patients with ESRD will require either a kidney transplant or some form of kidney replacement therapy to remove toxins from the blood, namely hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Patients on hemodialysis require vascular access for treatment. Most patients start with a long-term hemodialysis catheter, but can have multiple catheters placed throughout their hemodialysis journey. Over time, patients can experience blockages in their central venous system due to repeat catheter placements. This challenge will require healthcare providers to seek less optimal access locations near the groin, which are prone to infection and are uncomfortable for patients during frequent hemodialysis treatments. The Hero Graph may be an access alternative for patients who are catheter dependent or approaching catheter dependency. The system is fully subcutaneous, resulting in lower rates of infection. It can also be placed in the upper extremities, making hemodialysis treatments more comfortable for patients. Dr. Wagner will explain why the Hero Graph may be an access alternative for hemodialysis patients and how he utilizes this unique vascular access system in his practice. And now back to the show. Today, our topic is regarding access for dialysis options of in-stage vascular access. To help us with this discussion, we have Dr. Jason Wagner. Jason is a vascular surgeon based out of Sarasota, Florida. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Hey, just an icebreaker. Will you tell us a little bit about um, your training, your practice as it stands right now? Yeah. So I grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia. So when I was in medical school, I was at Eastern Virginia Medical School, so EVMS, which at the time I did not realize was such a kind of major research and volume hub for dialysis access. Like you were just oblivious to all what was going on? I was like, oh man, I guess everyone's on dialysis here. (laughs) and. Turns out, no, it was just they had like 20 plus vascular surgeons and some transplant surgeons just doing a ton of it. And so it wasn't until I was in later in med school at residency when some of the devices that I thought were just commonplace, be it immediate access grafts or hero, I thought everybody had been exposed to them for years. And no, it's just that I saw them kind of first or very early on when I was at EVMS. So I graduated from EVMS, went to do an integrated vascular surgery uh, residency and fellowship combination at UPMC in Pittsburgh. Again, a huge vascular access, kind of huge tertiary referral center and and catchment area. You know, there saw kind of not just the bread and butter, but a lot of moldy bread and rancid butter. I haven't heard that line. That's good. I mean, so we saw a ton of it. And so then that obviously during our two research years, we ended up doing, you know, either basic research and I was allergic to all the different lab rats and animals in the lab. So it was very evident early on that I was going to do clinical research. Cool. And if you're on the clinical research track as part of the T32 grant from the NIH, you do a uh, master's in clinical research methodology. And so my clinical research focus was dialysis access related. So looking at large database data mining, the USRDS, and then also you know, prospective and retrospective studies of immediate access grafts and hero grafts. So let me ask you this. So you finished up your integrated residency fellowship. How long have you been out and what does the practice look for you now? Is it like private practice? Great question. So I'm in a you when you kill kind of very classical model private practice. I'm five years out now, loving every minute of it. So getting to both learn and kind of grow in the role of being a small business owner, but then also having the flexibility of you know, access to an OBL, access to, you know, household outpatient labs, things like that. And then obviously ORs kind of all over town. Nice. The biggest change for me, you know, in Virginia, Virginia Beach and Norfolk, Virginia, there was a decent, you know, amount of patients of varying ages and varying body habitus. In Pittsburgh, it's skewed a little younger, but also heavier. And so, you know, I think anyone over the age of 80, they just wrapped them in bubble wrap and shipped them either to Arizona or to Florida. 
And then when I moved down to Florida, I figured out where all those people ended up. <laughs> and so I have like the healthiest, they're in adrenal, but I saw like the healthiest 90 year olds or like the sickest 35 year olds. Wow. And so learning how to care for the, you know, non-engineering as a functional human has been a, uh, dialysis has been kind of a, an interesting kind of skewer learning experience early on. Cool. Very good practice. A couple more questions about the practice. So how many docs are in the group? Is it all vascular surgeons? Do y'all have cross specialty, anything like that? Yeah. Six of us are operative. We have one additional surgeon who used to operate, but now is just doing a uh, clinic and seeing patients in clinic. We have kind of a nice pure soul specialty, seeing especially with vascular surgery issues. I'm the only person in our group that does peritoneal dialysis. I'm the only one doing laparoscopic procedures, but we kind of just general vascular practice, ice cube, kind of a little bit heavier balance wise to dialysis, but still doing, you know, aortic, deep vein, et cetera. All right. So I kind of set the stage for in-stage vascular access, but really like the podcast I'm trying to drill down on and we'll try and cut out some of the fluff, but like we want to talk about the hero graft. And so without just launching into the hero graft, will you talk about like in-stage vascular access and how you think about that patient population? Yeah. So when it comes to end-stage vascular access patient, you know, it's a lot of, I, I kind of break it down into, it's, I mean, anything with anything, vascular access, right? It's going to be inflow and outflow. So I have patients that are end-stage vascular access, not because of any kind of venous outflow issues, but purely because of arterial, you know, have severe peripheral arterial disease or diabetic vascular disease or end-stage renal disease combination with the, you know, arterial calcifications associated with that. And then on top of that, you know, diabetes or PED and a smoking history, it's that patient population. Those are the ones that are actually, I think, probably the hardest to manage because I could figure out some sort of, you know, creative outflow 99% of the time. But if I don't have a way to, you know, plug an inflow in any way, then that's the person that's going to end up, you know, with a, a graft, you know, south of the horizon, you know, on their leg, or it's going to be you know, somebody who I'm going to be having catheter dependent, or I might try and, you know, coax them into bailing out towards peritoneal dialysis to get them off of the need for arterial inflow. So... That's the arterial side of it. On the venous side, especially in Sarasota, I have patients that have been on dialysis for 15, 20, 25 years. And, you know, if you look at their arms, they have, you know, you can count, it's almost like on a tree, you can count the rings. I can count the rings of how many, you know, oh, there was your brachiocephalic. Okay. There was your brachiocephalic. There was your first graft. There was your second graft. There was your third graft. And you know, that's not even counting the forearm. That's just upper arm. So I think, you know, with that, you know, we're talking people that have had numerous, numerous interventions. And so, kind of need to get creative. You know, are you going to kind of jump centrally and do a hero or are you going to try and do a sutureless venous kind of reanastomosis? I have a procedure I like to do. I call it the Phoenix procedure, right? Just basically takes where he's had a chronically down graft that someone's abandoned usually elsewhere. And they've now, like they're either a snowbird and they've come to Sarasota and you're like, oh, you know, my graft shut down like two, three months ago. They gave me a tunnel catheter and I came down here for the winter. And, you know, if they've had a ton of other options and on ultrasound, it looks like everything's open just beyond the anastomosis. I might take him to the OR, do an open throw him back to be cut down on it and try to recanalize the outflow. Small little, you know, covered stent across the area of disease, the venous anastomosis. And then I'll, you know, pull their arterial plug and they'll be up and running and able to be cannulated that, you know, that afternoon or the next day. I call it a Phoenix procedure just because like raising it from the ashes. I like that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I try and first, I guess, make the most of what I have before I have to put anything else into it. But yeah, the nice thing is when it comes to even the past like five, 10 years between hero and surfacer, being able to, you know, kind of reestablish central venous access either as a way to just get a catheter in so you can get a catheter out of a leg or to get a hero in has been huge. So let's tackle, I mean, because you, you talked about the two devices I really want to touch on, advanced tools to handle patients with limited vascular access options. But I want to talk about the hero first. So first, what does it stand for? And can you just, for people who haven't seen it or aren't familiar with it, we have plenty of trainees out there. We just kind of give it like a high level overview of like what exactly the hero graft is. So the best way I can describe a hero, it stands for hemodialysis, reliable outflow. And the idea of reliable outflow and hemodialysis, some would say that's like a misnomer. It's like a never event. It's not a thing. With hero it is. So the best way to describe it uh, and the way I tell my patients, I say, oh, you know, think back to like the 60s or the 70s or whatever they last manufactured, the El Camino, right? It's a pickup truck in the back and it's a car in the front. So it's like a pickup car. The hero, it's a graft by the arterial anastomosis, it's a graft up the arm, but then instead of plugging into the vein, it clicks in with a very sleek you know, titanium connector into what basically is a you know 20 French stent that's embedded inside of a silastic, you know, like a silicone tube. And so basically it's the best aspects of both a graft where it could be you know, inserted quickly and used quickly. It's a suture arterial anastomosis, but then you're skipping beyond the entire axillary and subclavian segment 
you know, and pariah few straight to the jugular and straight down to the uh, SVC and the caporetrial junction. And so the nice thing is, you know, you're getting a good large bore catheter for your outflow and you have, you know, a graft component immediately available to be cannulated, you know, within a couple of weeks if you're using a standard graft or, you know, if you use the superhero, which is even better branding. And oh man, I haven't heard of the superhero. It's so good. <laughs> no, superhero is great. So it's, it's, it's just like a regular hero, just more powerful. It was, you know, raised on Krypton. The superhero is the regular hero outflow component, but instead of having a graph that's already pre-connected to a little titanium coupler kind of quick disconnect click-in thing that goes into the celastic tube, it's a thing that joins the celastic tube to a pressure fitting onto a different type of graph. So if you, you know, for instance, needed to revise a graph and plug into it, or if you needed to, somebody's only access was a right IJTDC or a left IJTDC, you would simply rewire that, you cut down on the neck, rewire it, drop your central venous component, put it where you want it to be, tunnel out the distal component to the delta pectoral groove in the shoulder, and then you're going to basically hook this little pressure connector, pressure clamp connector onto the tube, onto the venous outflow component, and then you basically just slide the graft overlying the other end and the friction fitting clicks into place. So you can hook up an, a gore accuseal or a flexine. And the benefit there is you can take somebody who has no other access, you take out their TDC, you put in this thing, sew in the graft, and you have an immediate access or early cannulation graft ready to be used right away. And so I've had patients that we've literally sent from the OR to the dialysis unit, and sometimes we'll even access them in the dialysis, in the OR with their dialysis needles, you know, tegator and everything down sterile, and then send them to the dialysis unit. Ideally, you know, we just dialyze them beforehand, give them a day or two off, and then stick them in the graft. But it, it's nice because a lot of people used to have to just take the regular hero, cut off the majority of the graft portion, then sew on an immediate access graft. So it's one additional astomosis, extra time, a waste of, you know, a graft component. And so they've kind of figured, oh, a lot of people are doing this. Let's, you know, kind of make things that kind of meet the need. And so I think a couple of years ago, they came out with it and it's, it's very slick. All right. Superhero. Like it. So talking about the hero seems very nice. What patient population is this for? Like, when do you get to where you start considering having a patient for a hero graft? So the folks that, I mean, if I have a, a way to, and I see, you know, if someone has, they burn up both, you know, arms as far as axillary veins, you know, brachial veins. So if you're looking to have to basically be doing, you know, an axillary artery and vein cut down in the you know, infraclavicular space to get your inflow and outflow, you know, that's somebody where if I'm having to go that high up the arm to get up a venous outflow, that's a pretty morbid thing. And I always think, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen to someone with a dialysis access, aside from just like unmanaged or unmitigated steel where they get an ischemic extremity, it's going to be, God forbid, it gets infected because in vascular surgery, and I'm sure like in IR, you're always thinking, what's the next, you're not just preparing for this surgery, but like, what's the next one of the one after that? And I always think, okay, how much is this going to suck to take out if it's infected? And so, you know, and I've had them show for others. I've done cases back with us in training where we've done, you know, axillary cut downs for, to get our venous outflow because everything in the arm was just, you know, inaccessible or it's all scarred down. And when those got infected, it was just, or if a stent was at that area, you had to take out an infected, you know, stent graft. That's a really morbid operation and you're worried about brachial plexus issues, et cetera. The nice thing about the hero is you're just going straight to the jug. If it's open, you can get a wire through it. You can you know, balloon it open, get the central venous outflow, you know, to basically the catheter component in. You've got your outflow. You can connect that any way you want, you know, tunnel it how you need to, to get the graft connected to it. So for my patients that have had, you know, that have had actually Going back to the people I actually do the most heroes on, I'm actually using it to revise persistent or recalcitrant outflow issues in that proximal brachial to axillary to subclavian region, like a balloon I put a couple of stents in, it keeps coming back or going down, but you know, their fistula, be it a brachiospalic or a brachiobasilic is still open and they can just have massive arm swelling from their central venous occlusion or stenosis. That's someone where I can do a traditional hero and I'll just take the outflow portion of their patent you know, fistula or graft and sew it on to the hero. And then I've established them in durable means of outflow. So I'm probably using it just as much, if not more, for access revisions of a patent access or recently included, you know, graft as I am for a de novo or a new, you know, hero placement. Well, so one of the questions, and I don't know if it goes without saying, but basically it's all upper extremity work. So the hero in your algorithm would always come before any kind of ask access like in the leg or the thigh, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For me, it's, I mean, I will go to the ends of, I've talked patients and my nephrologist too. I will go to the ends of the earth to keep, you know, a dialysis access above a waistline 
I'd probably say it's probably once a month I have to take out an infected femoral loop graft on somebody. And it's usually somebody that's come in from out of state or out of our catchment area here in Sarasota. And so, you know, and those are the people that are then, you know, do the history, do an upper extremity venogram. And sure enough, yeah, like that's the person that their next access is going to be maybe take their femoral TDC that they have, convert it, you know, service them back to an IJ line, put an IJ tunnel line in for a couple of weeks and then convert that to a hero or just take them straight to hero on one side or the other. Going back to the, your question earlier, uh, as far as, you know, other patients I consider it for. So aside from the upper extremity revisions, it's also, you know, for central venous occlusion disease, it's also going to be the folks that, you know, have known strictures with pacemakers and, you know, a focal occlusion right there. It's like, I'm not going to, so say they've had an infection in their left arm, they've got a right-sided pacemaker, they have a focally occluded on venogram or on ultrasound subclavian right where the pacer wires are. I'm not going to try and recanalize that. I'm not going to create an access distal to that, knowing it's going to give either shutdown because of outflow problems or cause severe immediate arm swelling. You know, that's somebody that I'm going to say, okay, look, here are our options. Your jugular is open. I can bypass around your pacer wires by going to your jugular and down to your SVC that way. And I can get them a good durable access that will work the first time as opposed to, you know, kind of see if it takes fistula or the, uh, and more than that, they'll work, but they're just going to get massive arm swelling. And then the morbidity of that is just terrible. So I guess my next question is, how exactly do you the do you do the procedure? And if I had to guess, the hardest part of the procedure is working out how you're going to get like the catheter side of the catheter, like in the, the atrium. But I just want to kind of hear about like the process of actually putting in a hero graft. And then we can actually dig into like the advanced stuff, which I think will like kind of segue us into the surfacer. But just tell me, like, how do, how do you put in the hero graft? So the first thing is getting that central venous access, because if I can't get the catheter in, you know, I want to make sure that I've identified a good arterial target for my nastomosis. So, you know, if it's going to be cutting down on an old graft near the uh, distal upper arm, and I'm going to, my plan is to use that as my inflow and just pull the arterial plug. So I'm not having to manipulate the brachial artery anymore, or if I'm just doing a new brachial artery anastomosis, I'll identify that on ultrasound first. I know where I'm going to be, you know, cutting down or getting arterial inflow. So then the next thing is going to be just making sure I can get into the SVC. So if they already have a tunnel catheter ipsilateral to it on the same side, I'm not as worried about it because like I know I've got at least a 14 or 15 French hole to maybe I need to expand it a little with a balloon or dilate it you know, serially, but I know I've got a channel to the SVC there. So that's going to be my first thing. If they've got a tunnel catheter in place, my usual thing will be I'll cut down on that, you know, at the neck, at the venotomy, take the catheter out, plug it with, you know, usually a 10 or 15 French sheath just to keep a channel there. Then I'll cut down on the arm, get my arterial inflow, make sure it's okay. Once I've got those inflow and outflow at least roughly established, I'll make my third incision at the delta pectoral groove, you know, kind of in the anterior medial shoulder. And then from there, I'll work on getting my venous outflow component into place. And so I have a stiff wire, usually either a straight Lundy or a Meyer wire or Amplatz, you know, always you know, straight down. I can affirm it. I always save a picture to make, you know, the malpractice gods happy of it going from the neck all the way, you know, through the KBR junction down into the uh, IVC distally. And it's a nice, good, strong rail for which to you know, do serial dilatation over, or if I need to balloon it, if there's a bit of a stricture, you know, or fibrin sheath from a prior catheter being there for a while. And so if I can get my, you know, hero tearaway dilator sheath into position, which is a, you know, it's a 20 French, it's a pretty good size thing. If I can get it into position and get it down, then from that, you basically advance the venous outflow component over its uh, removable dilator and stylet, which is then over the stiff wire. And your trick is you got to use, you know, sterile, you know, uh, water-based lube, get it lubricious, as they say, and then basically slide it in. And the big thing is, you know, years ago, people used to have problems with it where the tearaway sheath would kind of wrinkle or crinkle. And that is really, they've, they've fixed that over the past couple of years. I think they've revised it, I think, two times since. And that's been really nice because it's that to me is always the most stressful part of the procedure is just getting, making sure the sheath doesn't tear or break. And now they're very reliable, which is great. So it adds to the reliable aspect of it. So it's, it's a very reliable tearaway sheath now, which is surprisingly a silly thing to be really excited about, but it's awesome. So once you get your venous outflow and then I usually hook up like a little Christmas tree, your kind of step dilator uh, syringe, inject some you know, half and half contrast, see where my tip is roughly and I want to get kind of right at the top of the cable atrial junction, make sure that there's no residual fibrin sheath, especially if they've had a prior TDC there. If they've had a ton of tunnel catheters, and if I sometimes what I'll do is I'll just take a quick picture from above first, just through that, you know, kind of placeholder sheath to make sure there's no fibrin sheath. And I'll done that. If I see that there, then sometimes I'll either stick it, stick the jugular a second time. 
So I'm not in the fiber sheath or I'll balloon disrupt it first. Because you know, even though this thing says reliable outflow, I don't want to be setting it up for failure by plugging a you know thing into a pigeonhole little like sticking it into an old dirty sock. Yeah. Yeah. So once that's in, it's in a good spot. I'll mark the screen, figure out usually there's like, you know, I feel like all my patients have had sternotomy. So there's a sternal wire or a rib I can mark it against. I save a picture so I know roughly on the screen regarding some anatomic landmarks. And I'm doing these, you know, either most of them are at a hybrid suite. Sometimes they're in a uh, regular OR with a C arm, but I'll usually just kind of save an antioch mark as to where the tip of that catheter is, the venous oxygen component. And the nice thing, it's got a nice radio opaque band on it. So it's, it's easy to figure out where it is. So I'll put it in kind of right there and then lock it with heparinized saline. There's a very nice kind of uh, plastic clamp that comes with it that's catheter or venous outflow component tube safe. And I click that, you know, right at the venotomy, right at the neck where I, the cut down incision is, because that way I know it's not going to go any further. And if it's come back at all, I know I can push it back to that level and it's going to be roughly at the right spot. So once that, and this point I've removed my wire and the dilator from it. So it's just the catheter in the SVC. At this point, I will take usually like a, aortic clamp or a wire the hypogastric clamp and I'll tunnel from the delta pectoral groove to the incision in the supraclavicular incision at the base of the neck. I'll cut the end of the venous outflow component because there's this little like silicone kind of little handle on it. You cut that off, you grab the functionally the distal end or the proximal, what will be the flow proximal end or the kind of part that's sticking out of the body. You pull it through and I kind of, again, flush it, make sure it's in good position, make sure my outflow spot is where I want it to be. At this point, I'll have already exposed the brachial artery or whatever the arterial inflow is going to be. I'll figure it out the course that I want to tunnel in the upper arm to make it easy for cannulation. And so then I will tunnel from the arterial nastomosis up to the delta pectoral groove where the uh, venous outflow component is now coming out as it's tunneled. And I will then pull the graft component through from the shoulder down towards the elbow. And at this point, you know, you've got the kind of titanium click connector part that's built into the graft with the flexible external support, it's like a spring basically around it to prevent kinking at that graft metal junction. And then I will overlay that just kind of at the skin to figure out exactly where I want to cut the venous outflow component to end up. And at this point, I'll cut the venous outflow component, put the graft onto it. And I don't pull the graft all the way in or all the way down in the flush because this way you get more laxity in the graft because you can kind of put on the pressure connector, the pressure fitting. And then once it's secured into place, and basically all you're doing is it's like a finger trap. You're just squishing it in. And as you pull against it, it tightens up against it. And so I've done that. Again, spot check with Flora that, or with the clamp at the neck that the um, venous outflow component hasn't moved at all. And then with a little bit of tension on that, I'll just pull the graft taut so that it's a nice smooth course. It pulls everything under the skin. And then at this point, my outflow is temporarily clamps and it's hep locked at the neck. There's you know, no blood or anything in the graft or in the distal part of the venous outflow component. And now it's just pull up on the artery. I like to locally heparinize. I'm not a huge systemic heparinization person if I don't have to, especially with all the tunneling that can just get big hematomas. And so I'll pull up on the artery, you know, each end, arteriotomy, the standard kind of running anastomosis, back bleed the graft and hero by clinking at the neck, forward flush the artery, boom, tie it down, and then you're going to have a thrill and brewery and it's going to be great. And the nice thing is because it's a pretty long conduit on the outflow, I mean, you can make a decent size arterial nastomosis, you know, six, seven millimeters. And because of the outflow resistance to the longer circuit, you're not going to be a huge setup for steel, but obviously still check, you know, the distal perfusion to the hand. So once it's in, how long before it can be used as like a standard graft? Yeah, standard graft. So you can do it as early as two weeks. Most of my patients will tell them two weeks and they'll kind of beg and plead to want to make it like two and a half or three, but the big thing is if you're going to do it sooner, you know, either switch to using a superhero and an immediate access graft or the cannulation graft as the cannulation segment, or just make sure that, you know, it's really meticulous hemostasis being applied a couple weeks out. So I guess my question is, is this, how come we don't see more hero graphs? Like how common are they? I mean, they're, they're in the Kadoku guidelines, right? I mean, like there's a specific mention, very hero graft. And, and so I guess, I, I mean, like, so I, I came from, I trained at a tertiary referral center we saw a ton of these. I kind of thought they were commonplace. And then when I got out into practice, I mean, every now and then, but they're, they're kind of like a rare bird in my scene. So I just want to hear it from your side. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I do a ton of them and even I am surprised by how rare I see patients with hero grafts. So I think it's, you know, a couple different things. You know, I think early on, I think I got a bad rap, but I think people, is a very much a learning curve. You know, people were putting them into anatomy that wasn't necessarily the most favorable, People were trying to rewire subclavian lines back when people were getting subclavian things, so they were kinking. They were kind of going off IFU. I think part of it's just simply the patient population. I mean, these aren't 
just end stage renal. These are end stage dialysis patients frequently. So their life expectancy isn't going to be as long. These are the folks where in the past it was only being used that Hail Mary, okay, you know, maybe another six months to live, but we don't want to do it with a catheter. And so they're kind of, you know, people are getting kind of tuckered out or tired with it. I think part of it is people sometimes are able to bail out to PD. So if you run out of arterial options or you run out of venous options, PD is growing, home based uh, dialysis is an option. You know, there are certain things you need for patients to have anatomically. Obviously, I need a SVC and a jugular to get into somehow. I need arterial inflow somewhere from the arm. But the other thing you need to make sure is that they have a good systemic, consistently high, high enough systemic blood pressure. So if someone has a systolic kind of resting, you know, for if they get that um, interdialytic hypotension that happens in a lot of dialysis patients, if they're running with a systolic of, you know, 80 or 90 or barely 100, that's the person that's going to get to a low flow state and they might clot off their access either on the circuit or while they sleep at night. So I think, you know, that's some of the patients that might get to the point where they would need a hero might not qualify because they've got such severe interdialytic hypotension that they're not going to physiologically qualify. And like you can bump them up. I think probably a third of my hero patients currently and every single one I've had to declot has been somebody that's had persistent hypotension. So now they're just managed with midodrin and or, you know, occasional Sudafed as an extra bump if they're still running low. Gotcha. Just as an aside, if you do declots, isn't the hero graph like the easiest thing in the world to declot? It is the yeah. <laughs> easiest thing to declot. It is like, you know, whether whether you're a cleaner person or a mermaid person or a, you know, suck it out type person with an angiocath, I mean, it's just like great. It's because, I mean, it's a tube. It's like a nice elastic tube. Like it's great. Yeah, it is kind of great. All right. That's just an aside for people who want to geek out a little bit about the hero graph. All right. So I, I want to take... I guess I thought we would actually get into it more. One of the things I thought you were going to tell me was going to be like the hardest part of the procedure was patients with central vascular occlusion that just reestablishing access, you know, into the SVC or, or, or to the atrium was going to be like, you know, what are the rate limiting factors? I didn't hear you talk about that a lot. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. That is a major issue. Right. Yeah. That is a major issue that used to be an absolute, you know, either contraindication or major, like the biggest hurdle, right? So you got to get that outflow. And so- I used to think of it as this, like this impossible feat. So you see people like doing the crazy aggressive, you know, RF, you know, recanalization or the GB needle from below or, you know, et cetera. And so the nice thing is, you know, technology and industry has evolved to meet this need. And so, you know, originally Bluegrass and now Merit runs the technology and has, you know, helped kind of make it safe and available throughout the US. And so the surfacer, it's great. I mean, I was part of that first group that was at the, you know, FDA IFU training down in Houston. And I mean, it was honestly, it felt like being one of the cavemen hanging out with the people, like the, the first cavemen that created fire. <laughs> okay. And you're like, oh, this is warmth. This is great. Like you can make this. It's like, oh, like you can make it so I can just always pop back into the right IJ or create a new right IJ and just pull in either a TDC or eventually a hero. And they're like, yeah. And I thought the first three or four patients that they were going to demo it on or going to try it on were going to be these chip shot, like you know, just a focal little IJ. Two centimeter. Yeah, these were some severe, you know, relatively long segment, either jugular occlusions or SVC occlusions. And yeah, one guy even had a trach. I mean, it was some very aggressive stuff. And it was just, obviously, these are the surgeons that have been doing and the interventionists that have been doing it as part of like, you know, the safety trial. It was just awesome. And so with that, it was like, all right, cool. Well, aside from arterial insufficiency, I, God willing, will never have to go below the waist ever again for an access. And so if I can service or somebody, and I can pull it a TDC, that person can get, you know, a right-sided hero. Okay. So it's kind of game on for CVOs. But before you get too far into it, will you just tell the audience, like, what is a surfacer? What are the components of this? Like, why do you like it? Go ahead. So the surfacer is, imagine someone took, there's a, the movie, right? The Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, right? You know, so. Now we're really dating our, now we're really dating ourselves here. Early Rick Moranis. Yeah. So early Rick Moranis days. Everything seems really big. So, but I think there was a sequel or a secondary sequel. It's like, honey, I blew up the kid. And so it's kind of like a honey, I blew up the kid. It's basically a dialable curvilinear needle guide that you will use fluoroscopic, you know, kind of landmarks and fluoroscopic targeting to basically direct a needle guide out. And then you have a step advanceable needle wire that is a super sharp tipped wire that you'll advance through this curved needle guide directed towards a very, very fancy polished stainless steel washer that you're taping at your target exit site on the skin. And you basically kind of line it up. And then you, once you're lined up and oriented and you've done a two view to confirm you're appropriately oriented, you're basically with the, you know, you're accessing from the right femoral coming up. Yeah. You know, so 
the steps are come up from the right groin. If you're rewiring a femoral TDC, you're just a fresh access. Coming up right groin, up your know, iliac vein, up to the S- IVC to SVC. And you basically are going to first go through this with a, you know, a glide wire and a catheter, get as distal as you can. Then you put a stiffer wire there to guide your support sheath up. Then you're going to guide your hero device, your, hero, your surfacer device up to this position. And then you're going to have your targeting disc, which is fancy a, a washer that's tegatermed in position at the skin. And you're going to kind of look down the barrel of the washer to the orienting functional like crosshairs are opening in the tip of the surfacer. Through this, you're going to advance your curved needle guide out. And it's, it's been functional, you know, it's a sharpish hollow tube on a curve, kind of like a pioneer. And then you're going to just advance a needle wire, basically it's a wire that's super sharp straight up through that. And that will tent the skin or poke through the hole. Ideally, if everything's just right, you'll get the bullseye and you'll poke through and you're just happy if it just comes out adjacent to it or near it. And then a couple more advances, then you've got the needle wire sticking, you know, out of the skin. So it's inside to out, hence inside out surfacer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you'll advance a little more wire. And then basically what you're going to do is you're going to make a small nick in the skin and you will actually pull in a tear away sheath at this level. So instead of pushing and kinking, you're simply just going to draw it back and pull in the, you know, nice tear away sheath. And then through this, you'll drop a TDC, be it whatever brand you want. And then that will be, it'll be a nice way to develop the track to eventually then convert to a hero. But I mean, you could also use it for someone needs to get central venous access for a port or other things. You don't necessarily have to pull in these 16 French or 15 French, however big it is. Right. You pull in whatever you need. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a nice way to, to get central venous access, you know, again, from above. So if you're like, say you have an SVC occlusion and so, you know, you're, you're able to get just in the very lowest portion of the SVC, you can't just go, I imagine like if it's angled, you want to angle anteriorly, but like first you have to go cephalide and then angle anteriorly. Like how does that work? Like you first, like you just go like the SVC portion and then you turn the angle guide on and you can push anterior and up or. Correct. So you want to be able to get it up to where the angle guide's going to be up above or at the level of the clap hole because the needle wire, the needle guide will come up a little bit. And so, you know, one of the big things for this, and I, I know it's part of the IFU for sure, is that you need to have preoperative imaging. So you can't just say, oh, this person's got a jugular occlusion. Sure. You know, I'm just going to pull out a hero and a brother surfacer and just shove it in there and we'll do this thing. So, you know, they're going to want to have either venography and non contrast CT or ideally a CT venogram or a CT with venous phase contrast so you can delineate the anatomy. And like odds are, the people, the patients have probably had it recently. If not, just get it. Because, you know, you want to make sure that if it's tons of sprintation, a lot of these folks, you know, one of the major contraindications to using a surfacer is if they have a nominant vein stent coming across from the left to the right, you're going to get tangled up in that and that's going to be a bad time. So, I mean, that's a direct, you know, against the IFU approach. So for me, I have been moderately aggressive in my use of it, but I think for me, it's the, the best part about it is if someone's got an occluded IJ, you know, from having had prior catheters, I mean, you know where it's going to be occluded, you know, there's going to be a little stump just off the SVC that you're going to be able to get your surfacer into. And then from there, guide comes out, needle goes up, you're through the skin, and now you're back into the SVC from above. Yeah, so then you, yeah, you have access and you have... Yeah, and so that, that's, I don't want to call it like the chip shot surfacer use, but it's um, it's a lot easier and a lot safer to start with like those cases before you're doing the you know, super aggressive, half the SVC is out and you're just kind of wedging it up into some collateral branch to then get your needle guide out. I have, I have not been that aggressive yet. Okay. But I also, they've just been fortunate that the patients that I've had have been, you know, relatively, not say chip shot, but more straightforward and approachable anatomy. Okay. Well, so this was like the reason I thought like these two devices would kind of marry well to each other. I guess I just thought there was room for patients who were maybe central venous occlusion, exhausted vascular access options in the arm, and then you use the surfacer, recan the IJ or the SVC, and then boom, you have, it's kind of like game on, you have access, and then you could pull whatever you want. You kind of mentioned like a TDC, but you could also pull like a hero graft in, right? Yeah, you can pull the hero in. So they, they kind of recommend that you do a TDC as a, as a placeholder. Okay. Uh, just to kind of let the, the tissues kind of mature. And so the tissues can kind of just acclimate, stabilize a bit around the catheter tract because it's not a true, as of now, they don't have a way to easily set up or pull in the hero stepwise dilator because it's just, you don't, you're not really going into a normally easily compressible from the outside place. So it's better to have that kind of scarred, pseudo scarred into place tracked okay. first to then dilate that up versus, you know, if God forbid you have a problem getting your dilator or something, you're not dealing with functionally a 20 French hole coming off the proximal SVC. I see. Yeah. So how many, I kind of want to know, like, so if you have someone like 
vacationing in Florida for the month and they end up seeing you for whatever reason and they're getting dialysis through like a tunnel a tunneled femoral catheter is this like a good patient if they have like like will you work that patient up for potentially like you know why do they have the groin catheter like have you seen some situations where that led you to then like use a surfacer to then like bring something up and like get the tunnel catheter out of the leg and then put it in like in your standard ij really yeah so i had one we've had access to it in our hospital for about the past eight months so it's kind of just right towards the tail end of our seasonal. There's like a good to get the purchasing agreements and all the stuff approved through the hospital that they actually get it on the shelf. And as a shout out to Sarasota Memorial Hospital, they did a great job getting it you know approved quickly. That's nice. Not always we don't always get shout outs to the hospital, so that's that's a nice move. No, it was they were they were they were great. So it was kind of towards the tail end of the season that we had of the of the snowbird season that we had access to it. But I kind of do have a standing, you know, kind of wanted poster at a lot of the dialysis units and definitely at the one in the hospital that if you see someone coming with a femoral line, you know, call this number, you know, call my office because we want to know that that's somebody that at a minimum we can get it above the waist. And, you know, if they're going to be here for you know, a month or two, then you can easily get the imaging and hopefully get them converted to a hero. And some of the patients might just have a femoral line, um, you know. Also, I'll, I'll map their upper extremities because some of them just have a femoral line because for some reason they might have had, you know, an occluded IJ on one side, nobody tried or whatever, and they said, oh, let's throw in a femoral line and be done. And so that's somebody that might just, if they've got an open IJ, don't worry, I love the surface server. I'm not going to use them. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'll, uh, so that, that person can get a regular TDC, you know, on the right side or even the left, then we'll be able to go from there to get them an upper extremity access again, usually. So we're coming up on our hour, like, so we got like a, a little bit of time left, but if you have any final thoughts, whether it's about the hero graft or the surfacer, like what would you want? So we have, with a big IR audience, we have some vascular surgery, people, interventional cardiology. What are like kind of final thoughts is either with the hero graft or the surfacer when it comes to the dialysis circuit? With surfacer, it's great. You know, there is definitely a learning curve with it. Like how many, how many cases of learning curve? Like, I think probably two, two or three Oh, okay. All right. I mean, it's, it's not crazy, but I think that's if you're going for like the chip shot, easier cases. If you're going for the really big, hardcore, aggressive half the SVC is out, I would not do that in the first half dozen cases. And I would definitely not do that, you know, outside of a hospital where you have cardiac surgery as a backup. You know, I have a friend in Pennsylvania who did a case, got a couple of easy ones under the belt and kind of swung for the fences and everything went great until they took a picture and they're like, oh, we just lost the art line. And this wasn't my case, but he was kind of telling it to me at a meeting. And he's like, oh, we lost the art line. He's like, that's weird. Well, fortunately, they had an art line in the right arm, you know, the right radial. And they take a picture and sure enough, they kind of skewered through the uh, subclavian artery right at its junction. So they fixed it with a scent graft and ended up actually all being fine-ish. But the uh, that was, so I, I'm a big fan of the Einstein approach of, you know, you know, a smart man learns from his mistakes, but a genius learns from the mistakes of others. So, all right, right. you know, I think uh, Thanks for sharing. that's something that I will also be very wary or careful of and make sure really I'm perfectly oriented you know, it's going to be, they're going to have proctoring. It's, you know, mandatory thing for the first couple of cases. Okay, cool. Take advantage of Merit's opportunity for proctoring for that. But it's, you know, great, it's accessible technology. It is, there's nothing unintuitive about it. It's all completely intuitive approach as far as how you're going to orient it, how you're going to look, all the different steps. And if you basically just kind of, you know, colored by numbers, if you do all of the steps appropriately, there's an extremely high probability of success and most importantly of safety. So with Surfacer, it's just, Strictly stated the IFU, you're going to be fine. Start with the easy cases. With regards to the hero, the biggest thing is making sure that whatever you're using is your outflow. You know, say if you're rewiring a TDC, make sure that there's no fibrin sheath before you dunk your fetus outflow component into it. Make sure that there's no kink at the graft to titanium connector area that's laying nice and smoothly. It's not like an abrupt angle change as you tunnel it, because that's an area where I've seen, you know, I've had an issue once in the past and I've had some partners with issues there with their patients. And the most important thing for hero is make sure that the patients aren't hypotensive at any time, or particularly if they're in that interdialytic hypotension where they're constantly running in a systolic under 110. So my, my personal cutoff is if a patient walks into clinic and there's somebody that we're going to be kind of teeing up, or if I have a patient that I'm already teeing up in my mind that's going to be a hero patient, that's somebody where I'm having the nurse check blood pressure in both arms. You know, I've, I've had one patient where, you know, they had a left subclavian occlusion, their systolic was 80 on that side, but it was like 150 in the, the target arm. And it's like, all right, cool. Well, for the record, you're going to have to like, you know, get your blood pressure checked in your leg or somewhere else because your left arm is not accurate anymore. And you're not obviously going to blood pressure cuff on your graft anymore. But, you know, watch out for the hypotensive patient. All right. One more question. Even though I said that was like final thoughts, 
resources. So like if people want to learn more either about the hero graph, whether it's like the nuts and bolts of it or the surfacer, like, can you give them like if, if someone's like, oh my God, I've never heard of this stuff. Like, where might you send somebody or even trainees? Yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping that most major, at least in the kind of dialysis belt of America in the Southeast, I'm hoping that all the big academic centers are routinely using it or occasionally using hero. So with regards to the hero, I mean, I gladly proctor cases for merit medical. I know there are several other physicians that will gladly travel and proctor because, you know, I think going back to your question, as far as, you know, who, like why are we not seeing more of them? I think there's just people are kind of weary of it because it's all, it's these big catheters, these tubes, these things, all these steps. It's really, I mean, it's a 45 minute case when it's, you know, done correctly and efficiently and smoothly, maybe hour, hour 15, but it, it's, you know, it's not a, once the catheter's in, then it's just sewing the graft on and you're skipping it at astomosis. So it's not that bad. So getting somebody that can proctor a case, you know, Merit has a very good team of proctors, both on the clinical, on their actual employee side, but also physicians are able to go and help out and be there to observe and guide surgeons. I think obviously they have a ton of resources on their website. They're putting together a Think Vascular Access course that'll be sometime in the spring of 2024 that's going to focus on servicer, hero, peritoneal dialysis, and other like vascular access maintenance and management stuff. So it's going to be kind of a, a three-in-one or four-in-one kind of half-weekend or weekend course at the VASA, the Vascular Access Society of the Americas Biennial Practicum, which is like every other year they have a skills lab. And then I think at even the CETA meeting, they have a skills lab. So if you kind of target dialysis meetings, more often than not the day before or the day after the meeting, there is a skills lab or kind of educational thing as part of it. People are come down, welcome to come down to Sarasota and hang out with me anytime I've got one going on, as long as the hospital will approve it. Does that happen? People come down and watch in the lab? Yeah, no, I've had, um, I have about five, six folks come down over the past year, year, year and a half to see, some just have driven, some have flown, but to come down and just see how do we do it? And just kind of, and also just setting up the room, it's like little nuanced things. Yep, of course. That make it a little bit easier. And even just with your OR team, like if you're going to start, really start going into the, you know, kind of, I say the rare air or like the murky water of end stage dialysis stuff, it's going to be, you want to make sure you have a consistent OR team, be whoever your first assist is, but who your scrub tech is, you know, especially with Hero and the hybrid suite or an OR with the C arm, like you want people to know the parts, how to prep them. So you're not trying to do the cut down, but also make sure they're not messing up, you know, stuff on the back table. Thinking about that part. Right. But there, there are tons of resources to kind of, when you could do your first case at your hospital, the merit you know, proctors or reps will easily be able to help educate the, and in-service the staff very quickly on it. Well, just going back to like people going to your lab and, and you know, for all the docs out there, I think it's, I think it's commendable for people that take the time to show people the cases and also it's commendable, like think about like docs who are like flying across the country to like see someone else, like do a case and kind of walk them through that. I think that's commendable on both fronts. So for me, I mean, the only way I learned how to do anything that I can do is because I either was forced to take the time when I was in training or I chose to take the time after training to go and learn stuff. And, you know, when I was fortunate enough to go do that first round of folks to train on the surfacer, it was like one of the things like, yeah, I'm going to do this thing. It looks pretty cool on paper. I don't know. And then you see it done the first time. You're just like, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I want to do that. I think we just got the hook for the podcast. To the audience, thank you for listening. If you liked the show but want more, check out the show notes of this episode. Those can be found at www.backtable.com. And special thanks to the Backtable team, a lot of med students who make that happen for us. For others interested in supporting the show, like, subscribe, or share this podcast on social media, or just forget social media, just go old school, tell somebody about it. Old-fashioned word of mouth, talking to another human is really helpful as we continue to build this community. That wraps things up. We'll see you next time on the Backtable Podcast. Dr. Jason Wagner, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been awesome. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer, design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, social media and PR by Anne Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Manbir Singh Sabli. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 